This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. Election. Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. 1 Thessalonians 1 4. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. 2 Peter 1 10. The texts which head this page contain a word of particular interest. It is a word which is often in men's minds and on men's tongues, from one end of Great Britain to the other. That word is election. There are few Englishmen who do not know something of a general election to Parliament. Many are the evils which come to the surface at such a time. Bad passions are called out, old quarrels are dug up, and new ones are planted. Promises are made, like pie-crust, only to be broken. False profession, lying, drunkenness, intimidation, oppression, flattery, abound on every side. At no time, perhaps, does human nature make such a poor exhibition of itself as at a general election. Yet it is only fair to look at all sides of an election to Parliament. There is nothing new or peculiarly English about its evils. In every age and in every part of the world the heart of man is pretty much the same. There have never been wanting men ready to persuade others that they are not so well governed as they ought to be, and that they themselves are the fittest rulers that can be found. Footnote. The following weighty passage from the pen of the judicious hooker is commended to the attention of all in the present day. It is the opening passage of the first book of his Ecclesiastical Polity. He that goeth about to persuade a multitude that they are not so well governed as they ought to be, shall never want attentive and favourable hearers, because they know the manifold defects whereunto every kind of regiment or government is subject. But the secret lets and difficulties, which in public proceedings are innumerable and inevitable, they have not ordinarily the judgment to consider. And because such as openly reprove disorders of states are taken for principal friends to the common benefit of all, and for men that carry singular freedom of mind under this fair and plausible colour, whatsoever they utter passeth for good and current that which is wanting in the weight of their speech is supplied by the aptness of men's minds to accept and believe it whereas on the other side if we maintain things that are established we have not only to strive with a number of heavy prejudices deeply rooted in the breasts of men who think that herein we serve the times and speak in favour of the present state because we either hold or seek preferment but also to bear such reception as minds so averted beforehand usually take against that which they are loath should be poured into them. End of footnote. A thousand years before Christ was born, the following picture was drawn by the unerring hand of the Holy Ghost. Absalom rose early, and stood beside the way of the gate, and it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him, and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so, that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand, and took him, and kissed him. Second Samuel 15, 2-5 When we read this passage, we must learn not to judge our own times too harshly. The evils that we see are neither peculiar nor new. After all, we must never forget that popular election, with all its evils, is far better than an absolute form of government. To live under the dominion of an absolute tyrant, who allows no one to think, speak, or act for himself, is miserable slavery. For the sake of liberty we must put up with all the evils which accompany the return of members to Parliament. We must each do our duty conscientiously, and learn to expect little from any party. If those we support succeed, we must not think that all they do will be right. If those we oppose succeed, we must not think that all they do will be wrong. 
to expect little from any earthly ruler is one great secret of contentment to pray for all who are in authority and to judge all their actions charitably is one of the principal duties of a christian but there is another election which is of far higher importance than any election to parliament an election whose consequences will abide when queen lords and commons have passed away an election which concerns all classes the lowest as well as the highest the women as well as the men it is the election which the scriptures call the election of god i ask the readers of this paper to give me their attention for a few minutes while i try to set before them the subject of this election believe me it affects your eternal happiness most deeply whether you are in parliament or not whether you vote or not whether you are on the winning side or not all this will matter very little a hundred years hence but it will matter greatly whether you are in the number of god's elect in handling the subject of election there are only two things which i proposed to do firstly i will state the doctrine of election and show what it is secondly i will fence the subject with cautions and guard it against abuse if i can make these two points clear and plain to the mind of all who read these pages i think i shall have done their souls a great and essential service one i have firstly to state the doctrine of election what is it what does it mean accurate statements on this point are of great importance no doctrine of scripture perhaps has suffered so much damage from the erroneous conceptions of foes and the incorrect descriptions of friends as that which is now before us the true doctrine of election i believe to be as follows god has been pleased from all eternity to choose certain men and women out of mankind whom by his counsel secret to us he has decreed to save by jesus christ none are finally saved except those who are thus chosen hence the scripture gives to god's people in several places the names of god's elect and the choice or appointment of them to eternal life is called god's election those men and women whom god has been pleased to choose from all eternity he calls in time by his spirit working in due season he convinces them of sin he leads them to christ he works in them repentance and faith he converts renews and sanctifies them he keeps them by his grace from falling away entirely and finally brings them safe to glory in short god's eternal election is the first link in that chain of a sinner's salvation of which heavenly glory is the end none ever repent believe and are born again except the elect the primary and original cause of a saint's being what he is is eternal god's election the doctrine stated here no doubt is peculiarly deep mysterious and hard to understand we have no eyes to see it fully we have no line to fathom it thoroughly no part of the christian religion has been so much disputed rejected and reviled as this none has called forth so much of that enmity against god which is the grand mark of the carnal mind thousands of so-called christians profess to believe the atonement salvation by grace and justification by faith and yet refuse to look at the doctrine of election the very mention of the word to some persons is enough to call forth expressions of anger ill-temper and passion but after all is the doctrine of election plainly stated in scripture this is the whole question which an honest christian has to do with if it is not in the book of god let it be for ever discarded refused and rejected by man no matter who propounds it if it is there let us receive it with reverence as a part of divine revelation and humbly believe even where we are not able to understand completely or explain fully what then is written in the scriptures to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them isaiah eight twenty is election in the bible or is it not does the bible speak of certain persons as god's elect or not hear what our lord jesus christ says 
for the elect's sake the days shall be shortened matthew twenty four twenty two if it were possible they should deceive even the elect mark thirteen twenty two he shall send his angels and they shall gather together his elect matthew twenty four thirty one shall not god avenge his own elect luke eighteen seven hear what st paul says whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified romans eight twenty nine and thirty who shall lay anything to the charge of god's elect romans eight thirty three god hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world ephesians one four who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in christ jesus before the world began second timothy one nine god hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth second thessalonians two thirteen hear what st peter says elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of jesus christ first peter one two give diligence to make your calling and election sure second peter one ten i place these eleven texts before my readers and i ask them to consider them well if words have any meaning at all they appear to me to teach most plainly the doctrine of personal election in the face of such texts i dare not refuse to believe that it is a scriptural doctrine i dare not as an honest man shut my eyes against the plain obvious sense of bible language if i once began to do so i should have no ground to stand on in pressing the gospel on an unconverted man i could not expect him to believe one set of texts to be true if i did not believe another set the eleven texts above quoted seem to my mind to prove conclusively that personal election is a doctrine of scripture as such i must receive it and i must believe it however difficult it may be as such i ask my readers this day to look at it calmly weigh it seriously and receive it as god's truth after all whatever men may please to say there is no denying that the election of some men and women to salvation is a simple matter of fact that all professing christians are not finally saved but only some that those who are saved owe their salvation entirely to the free grace of god and the calling of his spirit that no man can at all explain why some are called unto salvation and others are not called all these are things which no christian who looks around him can pretend for a moment to deny yet what does this all come to but the doctrine of election right views of human nature are certain to lead us to the same conclusion once admit that we are all naturally dead in trespasses and sins and have no power to turn to god once admit that all spiritual life in the heart of man must begin with god once admit that he who created the world by saying let there be light must shine into man's heart and create light within him once admit that god does not enlighten all professing christians in this manner but only some and that he acts in this matter entirely as a sovereign giving no account of his matters once admit all this and then see where you are whether you know it or not you admit the whole doctrine of election right views of god's nature and character as revealed in the bible appear to me to bring us to the same position do we believe that god knows all things from all eternity that he governs all things by his providence and that not even a sparrow falleth to the ground without him do we believe that he works all his works by a plan like an architect of perfect knowledge and that nothing concerning his saints as his choicest and most excellent work is left to chance accident and luck well if we believe all this we believe the whole doctrine which this paper is meant to support 
this is the doctrine of election now what can be said in reply to these things what are the principal weapons of argument with which election is assailed let us see some tell us that there is no such thing in scripture as an election of persons and individuals such an election they say would be arbitrary unjust unfair partial and unkind the only election they admit is one of nations churches communities such as israel in ancient times and christian nations as compared to heathen nations in our own day now is there anything in this objection that will stand i believe there is nothing at all for one thing the election spoken of in scripture is an election attended by the sanctifying influence of the holy ghost this certainly is not the election of nations for another thing st paul himself draws a clear and sharply cut distinction between israel itself and the election israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for but the election hath obtained it romans eleven seven last but not least the advocates of the theory of national election gain nothing whatever by it how can they account for god withholding the knowledge of christianity from three hundred and fifty millions of chinese for eighteen hundred years and yet spreading it over the continent of europe they cannot except on the ground of god's sovereign will and his free election so that in fact they are driven to take up the very same position which they blame us for defending and denounce as arbitrary and uncharitable some tell us that at any rate election is not the doctrine of the church of england it may do very well for dissenters and presbyterians but not for churchmen it is a mere piece of calvinism they say an extravagant notion which came from geneva and deserves no credit among those who love the prayer book such people would do well to look at the end of their prayer books and to read the thirty-nine articles let them turn to the seventeenth article and mark the following words predestination to life is the everlasting purpose of god whereby before the foundations of the world were laid he hath constantly decreed by his counsel secrets to us to deliver from curse and damnation those whom he has chosen in christ out of mankind and to bring them by christ to everlasting salvation as vessels made to honour wherefore they which be endued with so excellent a benefit of god be called according to god's purpose by his spirit working in due season they through grace obey the calling they be justified freely they be made sons of god by adoption they be made like the image of his only begotten son jesus christ they walk religiously in good works and at length by god's mercy they attain to everlasting felicity i commend that article to the special attention of all english churchmen it is one of the sheet anchors of sound doctrine in the present day it can never be reconciled with baptismal regeneration a wiser statement of the true doctrine of personal election was never penned by the hand of uninspired man it is thoroughly well balanced and judiciously proportioned in the face of such an article it is simply ridiculous to say that the church of england does not hold the doctrine of this paper in controverted matters i desire to speak courteously and cautiously i wish to make allowance for the many varieties of men's temperaments which insensibly affect our religious opinions and for the lasting effect of early prejudices i freely concede that wesley fletcher and a whole host of excellent methodists and arminians have always denied election and that many deny it to this day i do not say that to hold election is absolutely necessary to salvation though to be one of god's elect undoubtedly is necessary but i cannot call any man my master in theological matters my own eyes see the doctrine of personal election most clearly stated both in scripture and the seventeenth article of the church of england i cannot give it up i believe firmly that it is an important part of god's truth and one which to godly persons is full of sweet pleasant and unspeakable two the next thing that i wish to do is to fence the doctrine of election with cautions and to guard it against abuse 
this is a branch of the subject which i hold to be of vast importance all revealed truth is liable to be wrested and perverted it is one of satan's chief devices to make the gospel odious by tempting men to distort it perhaps no part of christian theology has suffered so much damage in this way as the doctrine of personal election let me proceed to explain what i mean i am not one of god's elect says one man it is no use for me to do anything at all in religion it is a waste of time for me to keep the sabbath attend the public worship of god read my bible say my prayers if i am to be saved i shall be saved if i am to be lost i shall be lost in the meantime i sit still and wait this is a sore disease of the soul but i fear it is a very common one i am one of god's elect says another man i am sure to be saved and go to heaven at last no matter how i may live and go on exhortations to holiness are legal recommendations to watch and crucify self are bondage though i fall god sees no sin in me and loves me all the same though i often give way to temptation god will not let me be altogether lost where is the use of doubts and fears and anxieties i am confident i am one of the elect and as such i shall be found in glory this again is a sore disease but i fear it is not altogether uncommon now what shall be said to men who talk in this way they need to be told very plainly that they are wresting a truth of the bible to their own destruction and turning meat into poison they need to be reminded that their notion of election is a miserably unscriptural one election according to the bible is a very different thing from what they suppose it to be it is most intimately connected with other truths of equal importance with itself and from these truths it ought never to be separated truths which god has joined together no man should ever dare to put asunder a for one thing the doctrine of election was never meant to destroy man's responsibility for the state of his own soul the bible everywhere addresses men as free agents as beings accountable to god and not as mere logs and bricks and stones it is false to say that it is useless to tell men to cease to do evil to learn to do well to repent to believe to turn to god to pray everywhere in scripture it is a leading principle that man can lose his own soul that if he is lost at last it will be his own fault and his blood will be on his own head the same inspired bible which reveals this doctrine of election is the bible which contains the words why will ye die o house of israel ye will not come unto me that ye might have life this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil ezekiel eighteen thirty one john five forty and three nineteen the bible never says that sinners miss heaven because they are not elect but because they neglect the great salvation and because they will not repent and believe the last judgment will abundantly prove that it is not the want of god's election so much as laziness the love of sin unbelief and unwillingness to come to christ which ruins the souls that are lost b for another thing the doctrine of election was never meant to prevent the fullest freest offer of salvation to every sinner in preaching and trying to do good we are warranted and commanded to set an open door before every man woman and child and to invite every one to come in we know not who are god's elect and whom he means to call and convert our duty is to invite all to every unconverted soul without exception we ought to say god loves you and christ has died for you to every one we ought to say awake repent believe come to christ be converted turn call upon god strive to enter in come for all things are ready to tell us that none will hear and be saved except god's elect is quite needless we know it very well 
but to tell us that on that account it is useless to offer salvation to any at all is simply absurd who are we that we should pretend to know who will be found god's elect at last no indeed those who now seem first may prove last and those who seem last may prove first in the judgment day we will invite all in the firm belief that the invitation will do good to some we will prophesy to the dry bones if god commands us we will offer life to all though many reject the offer in so doing we believe that we walk in the steps of our master and his apostles c for another thing election can only be known by its fruits the elect of god can only be discerned from those who are not elect by their faith and life we cannot climb up into the secret of god's eternal counsels we cannot read the book of life the fruits of the spirit seen and manifested in a man's conversion are the only grounds on which we can ascertain that he is one of god's elect where the marks of god's elect can be seen there and there only have we any warrant for saying this is one of the elect how do i know that yon distant ship on the horizon of the sea has any pilot or steersman on board i cannot with the best telescope discern anything but her masts and sails yet i see her steadily moving in one direction that is enough for me i know by this that there is a guiding hand on board though i cannot see it just so it is with god's election the eternal decree we cannot possibly see but the result of that decree cannot be hidden it was when st paul remembered the faith and hope and love of the thessalonians that he cried i know your election of god first thessalonians one four for ever let us hold fast this principle in considering the subject before us to talk of any one being elect when he is living in sin is nothing better than blasphemous folly the bible knows of no election except through sanctification no eternal choosing except that we should be holy no predestination except to be conformed to the image of god's son when these things are lacking it is mere waste of time to talk of election first peter one two ephesians one four romans eight twenty nine d last but not least election was never intended to prevent men making a diligent use of all means of grace on the contrary the neglect of means is a most suspicious symptom and should make us very doubtful about the state of a man's soul those whom the holy ghost draws he always draws to the written word of god and to prayer where there is the real grace of god in a heart there will always be love to the means of grace what saith the scripture the very christians at rome to whom st paul wrote about foreknowledge and predestination are the same to whom he says continue instant in prayer romans twelve twelve the very ephesians who were chosen before the foundation of the world are the same to whom it is said put on the whole armour of god take the sword of the spirit pray always with all prayer ephesians six eighteen the very thessalonians whose election paul said he knew are the christians to whom he cries in the same epistle pray without ceasing first thessalonians five seventeen the very christians whom peter calls elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father are the same to whom he says desire the sincere milk of the word watch unto prayer first peter two two four seven the evidence of texts like these is simply unanswerable and overwhelming i shall not waste time by making any comment on them an election to salvation which teaches men to dispense with the use of all means of grace may please ignorant people fanatics and antinomians but i take leave to say that it is an election of which i can find no mention in god's word i know not that i can wind up this part of my subject better than by quoting the latter part of the seventeenth article of the church of england i commend it to the special attention of all my readers and particularly the last paragraph 
as the godly consideration of predestination and our election in christ is full of sweet pleasant and unspeakable comfort to godly persons and such as feel in themselves the working of the spirit of christ mortifying the works of the flesh and their earthly members and drawing up their mind to high and heavenly things as well because it doth greatly establish and confirm their faith of eternal salvation to be enjoyed through christ as because it doth fervently kindle their love towards god so for curious and carnal persons lacking the spirit of christ to have continually before their eyes the sentence of god's predestination is a most dangerous downfall whereby the devil doth thrust them either into desperation or into wretchedness of most unclean living no less perilous than desperation furthermore we must receive god's promises in such wise as they be generally set forth to us in holy scripture and in our doings that will of god is to be followed which we have expressly declared unto us in the word of god these are wise words this is sound speech that cannot be condemned for ever let us cling to the principle contained in this statement well would it have been for the church of christ if the doctrine of election had always been handled in this fashion well would it be for all christians who feel puzzled by the heights and depths of this mighty doctrine if they would remember the words of scripture the secret things belong unto the lord our god but those which are revealed belong unto us and to our children for ever that we may do all the words of this law deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine i will now conclude the whole subject with a few plain words of personal application one first of all let me entreat every reader of this paper not to refuse this doctrine of election merely because it is high mysterious and hard to be understood is it reverent to do so is it treating god's word with the respect due to revelation is it right to reject anything written for our learning and to give it hard names merely because some misguided men may have misused it and turned it to a bad purpose these are serious questions they deserve serious consideration if men begin rejecting a truth of scripture merely because they do not like it they are on slippery ground there is no saying how far they may fall what after all do men gain by refusing the doctrine of election does the system of those who deny election save one soul more than that of those who hold it certainly not do those who hold election narrow the way to heaven and make salvation more difficult than those who deny it certainly not the opponents of election maintain that none will be saved except those who repent and believe well the advocates of election say just the same the opponents of election proclaim loudly that none but holy people go to heaven well the advocates of election proclaim the same doctrine just as loudly what then i ask once more is gained by denying the truth of election i answer nothing whatever and yet while nothing is gained a great deal of comfort seems to be lost it is cold comfort to be told that god never thought on me before i repented and believed but to know and feel that god had purposes of mercy toward me before the foundation of the world and that all the work of grace in my heart is the result of an everlasting covenant and an eternal election is a thought full of sweet and unspeakable consolation a work that was planned before the foundation of the world by an architect of almighty power and perfect wisdom is a work which will never be allowed to fail and be overthrown two in the next place let me entreat every reader of this paper to approach this doctrine of election from the right end and not to confuse his mind by inverting the order of truth let him begin with the first elements of christianity with simple repentance toward god and faith toward our lord jesus christ and so work his way toward election let him not waste his time by beginning with inquiries about his own election let him rather attend first to the plain marks of an elect man and never rest till these marks are his own let him break off from all known sin and flee to christ for pardon peace mercy and grace 
let him cry mightily to god in prayer and give the lord no rest till he feels within him the real witness of the spirit he that begins in this fashion will thank god one day for his electing grace in eternity if not in time it is an old and quaint saying but a very true one a man must first go to the little grammar school of repentance and faith before he enters the great university of election and predestination the plain truth is that god's scheme of salvation is like a ladder let down from heaven to earth to bring together the holy god and the sinful creature man god is at the top of the ladder and man is at the bottom the top of the ladder is far above out of our sight and we have no eyes to see it there at the top of that ladder are god's eternal purposes his everlasting covenant his election his predestination of a people to be saved by christ from the top of that ladder comes down that full and rich provision of mercy for sinners which is revealed to us in the gospel the bottom of that ladder is close to sinful man on earth and consists of the simple steps of repentance and faith by them he must begin to climb upwards in the humble use of them he shall mount higher and higher every year and get clearer glimpses of good things yet to come what can be more plain than the duty of using the steps which are close to our hands what can be more foolish than to say i will not put my foot on the steps at the bottom until i clearly understand the steps at the top away with such perverse and childish reasonings common sense alone might tell us the path of duty if we would only make use of it that duty is to use simple truths honestly and then to believe that higher truths will one day be made plain to our eyes how and in what manner the love of the eternal god comes down to us may have much about it which is hard for poor worms like us to understand but how we poor sinners are to draw near to god is clear and plain as the sun at noonday jesus christ stands before us saying come unto me let us not waste time in doubting quibbling and disputing let us come to christ at once just as we are let us lay hold and believe three in the last place let me entreat every true christian who reads this paper to remember the exhortation of st peter give diligence to make your calling and election sure second peter one ten surer in the sight of god than your election has been from all eternity you cannot make it with him there is no uncertainty nothing that god does for his people is left to chance or liable to change but surer and more evident to yourself and to the church your election can be made and this is the point that i wish to press on your attention strive to obtain such well-grounded assurance of hope that as st john says you may know that you know christ first john two three strive so to live and walk in this world that all may take knowledge of you as one of god's children and feel no doubt that you are going to heaven listen not for a moment to those who tell you that in this life we can never be sure of our own spiritual state and must always be in doubt the roman catholics say so the ignorant world says so the devil says so but the bible says nothing of the kind there is such a thing as strong assurance of our acceptance in christ and a christian should never rest till he has obtained it that a man may be saved without this strong assurance i do not deny but that without it he misses a great privilege and much comfort i am quite sure strive then with all diligence to make your calling and election sure lay aside every weight and the sins that most easily beset you hebrews twelve two be ready to cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye if need be settle it firmly in your mind that it is the highest privilege on this side of the grave to know that you are one of the children of god they that contend for place and office in this world are sure to be disappointed when they have done all and succeeded to the uttermost their honours are thoroughly unsatisfying and their rewards short-lived seats in parliament and places in cabinets must all be vacated one day 
at best they can only be held for a few years but he that is one of god's elect has a treasure which can never be taken from him and a place from which he can never be removed blessed is that man who sets his heart on this election there is no election like the election of god